<clears throat> Hello. Hi, Etienne. Hi. I think they're just getting ready. People are coming on board. There are now 211 participants. It's looking good. I know, given that you have a tight schedule, let me know when you want to start. And I'm sure Bess will be okay with that. Give it another minute or two, I guess. Okay. Bess, you've got, let, let's start in two minutes at four minutes past the hour. So I just kick off and I hand to you or? Yeah. Okay. Yes. That's lovely. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Hi, Beth. Thank you, Etienne, and thank you, Alex. So Etienne, perhaps you want to kick off? All right. So good day, everybody. Welcome to this webinar on corporal punishment and public health. I'm really excited and really happy this webinar is taking place on such an important topic. Corporal punishment against children has been around probably as long as there have been parents and children. And it has for a very long time been considered a normal occurrence and by some even a necessary part of education. But we gradually have learned that this does not need to be like that. And in fact, that it should not be like that. There are many arguments to ban corporal punishment, not the least that if we want to achieve SDG target 16.2, we do have to ban corporal punishment. But there are, of course, other arguments, including the human rights argument, uh, that this is a total violation of the conventions on the rights of the child. From a public health perspective, we want to understand the harm done by corporal punishment. And increasingly, the evidence uh, has been gathered and uh, disseminated about the many different ways corporal punishment does cause harm to children uh, for the rest of their life sometimes. Uh, and that's why I'm so happy we are here today to hear from some of the best experts about what we know in terms of evidence about the different harms of corporal punishment. So thanks to all on behalf of the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children and the World Health Organization who are co-organizing uh, this event for joining us. And a big thanks also to the experts, some of the best in the world who are joining us today. Welcome. So thanks very much, Etienne. Etienne is the director of our Department for Social Determinants of Health at WHO in Geneva and I'm the head of the Violence Prevention Unit there. My name is Alex Butchart. I'll briefly give some housekeeping notes and introduce the speakers. Um, first off, the objectives of the webinar are, as I hope you have all read, to promote understanding of research on the corporal punishment of children, apply a public health lens in understanding corporal punishment and addressing its outcomes and the mechanisms that produce them, reflect on strategies for ending corporal punishment, in particular public health recommendations and those that use the INSPIRE framework, including the role of laws and approaches that support parents and caregivers in the, in the use of nonviolent discipline. I mentioned a few housekeeping notes, and these are, as has been mentioned in the chat, 
that the webinar will be recorded and sent to everyone afterwards together with the presentations. There's interpretation from English and French and Spanish. Go to the interpretation button at the bottom of the screen to select the language. And please post your questions in the chat function. There'll be a chance to answer them during the panel discussion and our colleagues will be collecting them and categorizing them as you put them in. So as I'm sure you've all read, the speakers today are, as Etienne said, the cream of the crop in terms of the world experts. We have Elizabeth Gershoff from the University of Texas, Jorge Cuartas, a researcher at Harvard University, Joan Durant from the University of Manitoba, Sonia Vojito from the End Violence Partnership, and Howard Taylor, Executive Director of the End Violence Partnership. So we'll have about 50 minutes when Elizabeth, Jorge, and Joan will present what research tells us about the impact of corporal punishment. And this will be followed with an overview of strategies for the elimination of corporal punishment using INSPIRE as a framework for prevention. We'll then have an audience poll followed by a 20 minute panel discussion where the panelists will answer the questions that you've provided in the chat function. Sonia will then give a brief global progress update and call to action on implementing key strategies. And finally, Howard Taylor will provide some closing remarks. So with that, over to Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be with all of you today. Uh, hello from Austin, Texas in the US. And I'm going to be hopefully making the case that the elimination of corporal punishment of children is a public health issue. Uh, from a research standpoint. I want to begin by just defining corporal punishment so that we are all on the same page. Uh, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child has defined corporal punishment or physical punishment, those terms are synonymous, as any punishment in which physical force is used and intended to cause some degree of pain or discomfort, however light. Now, why is corporal punishment a public health issue? I'm gonna make several uh, arguments in that uh, to make that case. The first is that corporal punishment is prevalent uh, around the world. Corporal punishment physically injures children. It impairs their development. It is universally harmful and it is costly to society. Corporal punishment is indeed prevalent around the world. Uh, UNICEF has done several um, surveys and found that uh, parents of two to four-year-old children, 63% of them report that they use corporal punishment with their children. And corporal punishment happens in places other than homes. Um, schools around the world still allow corporal punishment of children, including my home country of the United States. Uh, and so UNICEF has calculated that 732 million children live in countries where corporal punishment is permitted and thus they are at risk of that corporal punishment. There's ample evidence that corporal punishment physically injures children. Corporal punishment is a form of violence. We know that the uh, Committee on the Rights of the Child has made that argument very clearly and any form of violence is intended to injure someone else. So we should not be surprised that corporal punishment physically injures children. And in countries that distinguish between corporal punishment and what we might call physical abuse or uh, severe injury, the majority of that abuse starts out as intentional corporal punishment. So the parents believe they are disciplining their child and they get carried away and hurt their child, um, even though they may not have intended to physically injure their child, uh, they do end up doing so. Interviews with children have confirmed that corporal punishment is physically painful. And there's ample evidence from a range of countries that school corporal punishment results in sometimes severe injuries to children. Now the prevention of child maltreatment or physical abuse has been recognized as a public health issue because maltreatment leads to so many different problems. We have ample evidence that abuse and maltreatment have lasting problems into adulthood for those who suffer. And the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that we often call the CDC 
has stated that eliminating corporal punishment is a key way to prevent physical abuse and injury to children. If we do not allow corporal punishment, if parents move to other ways of disciplining, we could eliminate so much pain and suffering uh, of children. A corporal punishment has also been demonstrated to be an adverse childhood experience or an ACE. And adverse childhood experiences have become a focus of concern in public health and medicine um, because it has been shown that ACEs have long-term effects into adulthood uh, linked to things such as uh, mental health problems, but also um, physical health problems such as um, lung disease and heart disease. And the original ACEs study, which was conducted in California uh, several years ago, asked participants whether they had been corporally punished as a child but the data had never been analyzed. And so I collaborated with colleagues at the CDC, which now holds that ACEs data to analyze that corporal punishment and compare it to other ACEs that we recognize. And so I don't normally put up numbers in a talk like this, but I, I'm doing so today because I think it helps illustrate the point. And so this is a list on the left-hand side of all of the ACEs. All the ones in black are the 10 original ACEs from that original ACE measure. And then we have corporal punishment added in purple. The outcomes we examined in this study were drug use, moderate to heavy drinking, suicide attempts, and depressed affect. And what I wanna highlight for you first is that the first three rows confirm what we already know, that sexual abuse, emotional abuse, and physical abuse are harmful to individuals and have long-term effects. Sexual abuse is linked with all four of the outcomes, emotional abuse only with suicide attempts, but physical abuse with three of the four. But then if we look at corporal punishment in this next row, we see that corporal punishment is also linked to three of the four and in similar magnitude. And so the way to read these numbers is the numbers to the right of the decimal point tell you the percent um, greater likelihood that someone who experienced, in this case, corporal punishment would experience those outcomes. So in this case, corporal those who experienced corporal punishment as a child we're 42% more likely to experience drug use, 29% more likely to engage in moderate to heavy drinking, and 39% more likely to attempt suicide than those who were not corporally punished. And so you can see these numbers are somewhat similar to the numbers for the other forms of abuse. And so this, my colleagues and I, I think makes a pretty clear case that corporal punishment should be considered an ACE or adverse childhood experience. There's also ample evidence that corporal punishment impairs children's development. There have been hundreds of studies of child outcomes associated with corporal punishment. And my colleagues and I recently conducted a systematic review of these studies, uh, including our third speaker today, Joan Durant. Uh, we work with colleagues in uh, England and Ireland uh, to do a systematic review of all longitudinal studies. So these are studies that follow children over time and look at change in the outcomes. And that helps us determine if corporal punishment predicts changes in the child outcome over time. That helps get us a little bit closer to understanding this as a causal relationship because the corporal punishment is predicting something in the future. And so this article came out in The Lancet a few months ago. And I'm putting up this table just to kind of show you how clearly the results are consistent. So on the left-hand side, this column, you can see the different outcomes we examined. So we looked at uh, behavior problems like aggression or antisocial behavior, internalizing behaviors such as uh, anxiety or depression. We looked at positive things such as um, pro-social behavior, but also ADHD symptoms. Uh, I'm sorry, that's, um, uh, I should say it's inattention, that'd be a clearer way to say that. Uh, cognitive ability, so that's basically how well children are doing in school relationships, particularly with their parents, stress reactivity, and involvement with child protective services for suspected maltreatment. And what I have highlighted here in red is the column that would have shown any beneficial outcomes linked to corporal punishment. So if we had found that corporal punishment improved any of the outcomes on the left, we would have seen it in this column. And you can see pretty clearly none of the effect sizes uh, found that. So none of the studies found 
and overall beneficial effect of corporal punishment on children. In the very right-hand column, there are a few subsets that might have found a beneficial effect for one small group, um, perhaps gender or race ethnic group. But in general, overall for the full sample, there are no beneficial outcomes for any of these studies or for any of the outcomes. And the Lancet editorial board was impressed with our findings and they put our article on the cover of the Lancet that week with this last sentence of our article. There is no time to waste. All countries should heed the UN's call to uphold children's human rights and promote their well being by prohibiting physical punishment in all forms and all settings. We were pretty excited to get that recognition from the Lancet. Now, can we be sure that corporal punishment is the cause of these negative outcomes? Um, that's often a concern about this research. Do we know for sure uh, that it's not some kind of child effect, that the child is eliciting more corporal punishment because they are engaged in uh, problematic behavior? And we cannot do experiments uh, with children and corporal punishment. We cannot randomly assign children to be hit or not. And so we have to turn to other methods. And several recent research papers have used econometric methods to approximate the conditions of an experiment. So a treatment group and a control group, treatment in this case being corporal punished, and then a control group being those who are not corporal punished. And that allows us to study the impacts of corporal punishment on children in as close a way to an experiment as possible. And so I have published three papers using a method called propensity score matching, which is one of these econometric methods. And it statistically matches, uh, I, I, sorry, I use the term spank here. Um, that's the term we used in these articles that should be corporally punished and non-corporally punished um, so that the corporal punishment is the only difference between the groups. And all three of these articles, we found that children who were corporally punished had more behavior problems, more mental health problems, and more cognitive problems in school than children who had not been corporally punished. And I wanna la end on, an argument that corporal punishment is universally harmful. There's been some discussion that perhaps in some cultures, if it's normative, it, that it would have corporal punishment would have less negative impact, but there's absolutely no evidence that that is true. The experience of pain, the physiological processes that underlie that are universal across children. They are physiological processes that are the same, no matter where children live, where they are born. And we also know that corporal punishment has been linked with entirely negative outcomes for children across countries and cultures. And so I just wanna go through quickly how this physiological process works. Um, we can begin by thinking about a child being hit. What is the first reaction? The first reaction is pain. It is a physical reaction. That reaction is quickly followed by emotional reactions such as fear or anger. Pain, fear, and anger then lead children to engage, to think about what to do next. How are they gonna handle this experience? They can do several things. They can flee. So the fight or flight uh, uh, instinct, they can flee the parent. So flee the source of the pain. They can experience fright, which is a fear response and leads to the stress response system being activated. Or they can aggress against the source of that pain. And in this case, that would be aggress against their parents. And then th that is the immediate process. These processes get engaged over and over again when children are hit over and over again. And the systems get overtaxed, particularly the stress response system. And they in turn, all of these processes then in turn lead to long-term outcomes. So flight, we can think of leading to poor relationships with parents. Children don't want to be with someone who is hurting them, and so they avoid their parents, and they don't trust their parents, and they have, they end up spending more time with peers, and when they do that, and when they are unsupervised, they're more likely to engage in risk behaviors. Fright can lead to long-term anxiety and depression, and the fight response can lead to long-term aggression and conduct disorder. And finally, we have research from around the world that Corporal punishment is universally harmful to children. In one study I did with colleagues with uh, children and mothers from China, India, Italy, Kenya, Philippines, and Thailand, we found that corporal punishment predicted more aggression and more anxiety in all of those countries. And regardless of how normative 
corporal punishment was in those countries. And we now have multiple studies uh, that have linked negative outcomes for children with corporal punishment, regardless of country and regardless of how prevalent it is. And my colleague Jorge Cortes is going to be showing some of that in his talk. So to summarize, corporal punishment is a public health issue because it is prevalent and harmful and universally so. It is also, because it is linked with cost to mental health and physical health care in adulthood, corporal punishment is costly to society. But there is good news. Corporal punishment and the harms linked with it are entirely preventable. Law reform and parenting education can prevent corporal punishment and its negative outcomes. Thank you for listening. And I, we will be sharing these slides later and you will get all these references. And please feel free to email me if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Liz, for a powerful introductory um, statement, which I think has so much useful information in it. Without further ado, we're going to go straight on to Jorge. Please, Jorge, over to you. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, every, everyone. Thank you for, so much for joining us today from so many different countries and places around the world. Today, I'm going to talk about the developmental and health consequences of corporal punishment around the globe. And in particular, what I hope to do today is to summarize three key findings or lessons from recent uh, research on corporal punishment and child development in multiple countries. The first finding is that corporal punishment is prevalent around the globe. The second, that corporal punishment can undermine brain development. And the third one is that corporal punishment can impair cognitive and social emotional development across countries and across cultures as well. First finding, corporal punishment is prevalent around the globe. Recent studies using large-scale uh, nationally representative samples of children from UNICEF's multiple indicators cluster survey have identified that about two out of three children younger than five are exposed to corporal punishment, to spanking, to hit with objects, to beatings, and to other forms of corporal punishment, which is a prevalence that is quite similar to the one identified in the US and other high-income countries as well. In particular, using this data from UNICEF, we found that about 41% of kids are exposed to corporal punishment in Central Asia and East Europe. The prevalence was about 48% in East Asia and the Pacific, 55% in Latin America and the Caribbean, 65% in South Asia, 71% in Sub-Saharan Africa, and finally 76% in North Africa and the Middle East. While these numbers are very concerning and are extremely high, growing evidence uh, from this pandemic, from the COVID pandemic, shows that violence against children and corporal punishment in particular has been increasing uh, steadily, uh, which is another reason to, to really be concerned about this issue in this specific moment. We can understand or try to understand the high prevalence of corporal punishment and its increments amid the pandemic, as well as to start thinking about potential prevention strategies uh, to prevent and reduce corporal punishment against children from an ecological perspective, such as the one proposed in the WHO INSPIRE framework. In this ecological perspective, protection and risk factors, and in particular, the balance between these factors is gonna be very influential and determine also children's vulnerability or protection from corporal punishment. In particular, characteristics uh, of the child, such as the age, sex, gender, or also disabilities, for example, can place certain children at higher risk of experiencing corporal punishment. Similarly, at the family and household level, having unrealistic expectations of what children are able to do in different developmental stages. Weak social bonds, having caregivers with mental health challenges or adverse childhood experiences, or also experiencing poverty or domestic violence constitute additional risk factors for corporal punishment. At the community and society levels, we have that the social and legal normalization of violence against children, gender inequity, economic inequality, also exposure to contextual violence in the middle of crime and war and civil conflicts, uh, and also uh, high poverty also constitute additional risk factors. However, this exact same framework also shows that there are some protection factors that we can foster to promote children's uh, safety from violence and corporal punishment. In particular, we can promote children's social emotional skills, 
We can also promote caregivers' knowledge on child rearing, on positive discipline, and on child development. Also, safe context, also the shared parenting load. And at community and society level, we can work also on laws against corporal punishment on appropriate social norms that disincentivize uh, the use of corporal punishment and other forms of violence. Also social and economic and gender equity, and also availability of high quality health, education, and social services for families. Considering this framework, we can start to understand why corporal punishment and violence has increased amid the pandemic. We have a situation of this balance where several risk factors has increased, for example, poverty, unemployment, violence against women, behavior changes in children due to changes in the routines, also parental stress. And at the same time, we have an erosion of protection factors, such as disruption in social services, such as home visiting and other community-based services for parents and families, and also a closure of early childhood care and education uh, centers and schools as well. The second finding that I would like to share with you all today is that corporal punishment can undermine brain development, creating a biological consequence that can have long-lasting uh, impacts for children's trajectories. Corporal punishment, as explained by uh, Dr. Gershoff, can trigger several physiological and psychological consequences. In particular, we know from qualitative and quantitative evidence from several countries, including Brazil, Colombia, Ghana, New Zealand, the Philippines, South Africa, and the US, that children experience sadness, fear, pain, anger, shame, and guilt when are exposed to corporal punishment. Similarly, we know that children exposed to corporal punishment feel threatened when punished and tend to exhibit high hormonal reactivity to stress or an abnormal release of cortisol, which is known as the uh, stress hormone uh, in several different circumstances, likely due to a physiological stress caused by corporal punishment. Considering this, we can use a neurobiological perspective and neurobiological models to hypothesize how corporal punishment can lead to particular outcomes for children. In particular, we know from these models of human development that the physiological and psychological responses to corporal punishment can scale in relation to the severity and frequency of this exposure, leading potentially to activation in the neural systems which support dealing with danger and with threats, and also to physiological stress, which all together can lead to changes on the brain structure and function, in particular, reducing differentiation between fear and safety cues, also increasing reactivity to negative experiences across the lifetime, and also overloading biological systems, not only the nervous system, but also the digestive, the cardiovascular, uh, and other systems of the human uh, body. We have some growing evidence from neuroimaging studies showing that these predictions from uh, neurobiological models are actually quite plausible according to uh, this evidence. For example, a first study by Tomoda and co-authors found very important differences in the brain structure of children who were exposed to corporal punishment and other children who were not exposed to corporal punishment. In particular, they found reductions in the volume of the prefrontal cortex by 15 to 19% in adults who were exposed to harsh corporal punishment as they define it, uh, which was being hit with objects uh, during childhood. In particular, they found these differences in these areas of the prefrontal cortex that you can see in yellow in this image. More recently, we published uh, another study trying to assess differences in brain functioning between children who are spanked and not spanked, trying to discard other potential uh, exposures to violence, for example, to harsher corporal punishment. To do that, we decided to exclude from the beginning of this study children who experience more severe physical abuse or sexual abuse in order to compare exclusively children who were spanked, that is exposed to socially normative corporal punishment, and children who were not spanked. In this study, we found that children who were spanked exhibited a typical neural activation in response to threatening stimuli, in particular to fearful faces, in areas of the prefrontal cortex relative to children who were not spanked. In this figure, you can find uh, on yellow and red the areas of the brain where we found such differences. 
This image uh, refers to the same brain in different perspectives. So for example, the first one is this part of the brain. The second one is this part of the brain. And the two figures in the bottom is a slice of the brain uh, looking at, at, at both parts as well. Uh, and you can find those differences in yellow and red. I'm going to unpack a little bit what these differences and what these areas of the brain in particular uh, are telling us. So the first area where we found a difference was the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. This was very um, interesting for us because multiple studies uh, on harsher forms of violence, on sexual abuse and physical maltreatment, more severe physical maltreatment, uh, also identified differences in this exact area of the brain. Therefore, suggesting or reinforcing the idea that distinguishing between normative corporal punishment or spanking and abuse is meaningless, both from a perspective uh, or from a rights perspective, given that both are violations to children's rights, but also from an empirical perspective, considering that both can lead to similar developmental consequences in the same uh, regions of the brain. We also found differences in the middle frontal gyrus, which is this area that you can see in this uh, image, which is an area that is often engaged during effortful attempts to regulate emotional responses. We interpreted this finding as indicating that the brain of children who were spanked could have a tendency to interpret neutral situations or daily situations as threatening or as uh, involving some sort of danger. Finally, we found a very important sizable significant difference in the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex and the bilateral frontal pole, which is this area that you can see in this image. These areas are involved in several social cognitive processes, including social information processing. Therefore, suggesting that children who were spanked may be devoting greater attentional resources to processing threat danger and other um, negative stimuli, perhaps at the expense of other cognitive and social emotional processes, altogether suggesting um, that these children could be also at a higher risk of mental health uh, problems. Taking my study and the Tomoda study together and considering the broader field of uh, cognitive neurodevelopmental psychology, we can start understanding the consequences of corporal punishment, in particular because these consequences tend to concentrate on the prefrontal cortex, which is an area of the brain that develops from infancy to late adolescence. It's an area that is very malleable, plastic, or responsive uh, to the environment, so develops in response to the environment. And it plays a central role on high order cognition, for example, on executive function, and also on social emotional skills, like self-regulation. Suggesting, therefore, uh, and indicating also that behaviors and disorders related to self-regulation, such as substance abuse or risky and social behaviors uh, that are costly to individuals and societies, could be also uh, be related to this practice uh, early in life. With that, I would like to finish with the third finding, which is that corporal punishment can impair cognitive and social emotional development across countries and across uh, cultures as well. So building upon some of the work that Professor Gershoff just uh, described, I have been conducting a couple of studies trying to assess the causal effect of corporal punishment and, and spanking in particular on children's cognitive and social emotional development in different low and middle income countries. In these studies, uh, we have followed young children in time using longitudinal designs and use advanced statistical techniques and econometric techniques to identify the causal effect of, of spanking in particular. The first study I want to uh, discuss is a study of a national sample of Bhutanese young children. So it's, it's a large uh, national sample of children uh, from Bhutan where I found that spanking impairs social emotional development as measured by the IDELA, which is a very well known and validated measure of uh, uh, development early in life. And I found specifically that spanking could impair emotion regulation and conflict solving skills, which is quite consistent with the findings from uh, neuroimaging studies that show uh, impacts in particular on the prefrontal cortex. A second study, this time from Colombia, uh, we found that infants who were spanked at ages 9 to 26 months old 
showed a, a slower cognitive growth at ages 27 to 46 months, uh, therefore suggesting that the impacts of corporal punishment are not only related to social emotional development, but also to cognition, leading to potential problems on academic settings and even to economic uh, problems also in adulthood. Finally, uh, other studies have used uh, multi-country data from UNICEF's multiple indicators cluster survey, which again, it's a set of surveys that are nationally representative. Uh, in particular, this first study by Pace and his co-authors at the University of Michigan follow 62 countries, very diverse countries that you can see in this map uh, to assess the potential links between spanking and social emotional development. So I would like to summarize the findings from this study showing in red the countries where they found that spanking could predict negative social emotional outcomes, and in blue, the countries where they found positive associations between spanking and social emotional development. So as you can see in this figure, uh, which is very uh, clear to me, I think, uh, in most of these countries, in 59 of these countries, they found negative associations between spanking and social emotional development. Uh, showing very consistent results and showing that regardless of culture or country, spanking can also undermine and interfere with the healthy development of social emotional skills. Complementing this study, I conducted uh, another study with 49 countries and found that children who were exposed to corporal punishment were about 24% less likely to be developmentally on track on the Early Childhood Development Index which is a measure developed by UNICEF and currently serves as one indicator for the sustainable development goals, suggesting that the impacts of corporal punishment are also a major obstacle for global policy efforts and policy goals such as the SDGs. In some, these studies also show that corporal punishment is not beneficial in any culture or any country. To conclude, uh, not a single study has found that corporal punishment might be beneficial for children's health or development in any setting. In contrast, most studies from many diverse countries around the world have shown consistent links between corporal punishment and negative outcomes. The consistency of findings and this idea of an underlying biologically based mechanism, in particular brain development, suggests that corporal punishment might be universally harmful for children. And considering that corporal punishment is prevalent in the world and has increased amid the pandemic, I think there is an urgency to work, design, evaluate, and scale parenting programs, supports for parents, massive education campaigns, and legislation prohibiting all forms of corporal punishment. Here you can find my contact information. Please feel free to reach out if you have any questions or comments. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Okay, thanks so much for so very clearly laying out the biological mechanisms by which corporal punishment exerts its negative effects. With that, I'd like to hand over to John Durant. And following John, we will then break for a poll and an audience discussion. John, over to you. Thank you, Alex. Just get my slides set up here. I'm now going to speak about what we need to do to eliminate corporal punishment of children. Both Liz and Jorge have described how corporal punishment affects individual children and its cascading impacts on their families and their peers. Together, these impacts have monumental effects on societies and they exact tremendous costs in both human and economic terms. The outcomes of corporal punishment have costs for our health and education systems, our economic and social support systems, child protection, and justice. And the individual impacts from social dropout, or sorry, from school dropout, to later domestic violence, to suicide, take a huge toll on countries' productivity. To give just one example, a study of the costs of physical maltreatment, most of which we know is corporal punishment, are more than 39 billion US dollars annually in the East Asia Pacific region alone. These costs are now globally recognized to the extent that the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs include the elimination of corporal punishment of children. 
SDG 16 is peace, justice, and strong institutions. If we zero in on SDG 16, we find SDG 16.2, which is to end abuse, exploitation, trafficking, and all forms of violence against and torture of children. One indicator of countries' progress toward this goal will be the proportion of children aged one to 17 who experienced any physical punishment and or psychological aggression by caregivers in the previous month. In order to help countries reach this goal, a multi-partner global initiative has been undertaken under the auspices of the WHO. It's called INSPIRE, Seven Strategies for Ending Violence Against Children. All of these strategies are involved in the prevention and elimination of corporal punishment. I am just going to briefly focus on two that are of particular relevance. The first is the I, the implementation and enforcement of laws, and the second, the N, norms and values. I'll begin with the I. The objective of this strategy, the I of INSPIRE, is to ensure the implementation and enforcement of laws that prohibit and prevent violence against children, including laws prohibiting corporal punishment. At this time, 63 countries have prohibited all corporal punishment of children. Sweden was the first to pass such a law and that was back in 1979. Their law says, children are entitled to care, security and a good upbringing. Children are to be treated with respect for their person and individuality and may not be subjected to physical punishment or other injurious or humiliating treatment. Since 1979, 62 more countries have followed Sweden's lead. They are in all regions of the world except North America. 11 are in Central and South America, 35 are in Europe, one is in the Middle East, 10 are in Africa, and six are in the Asia Pacific region. Most of these laws are modeled on Sweden's law. They're intended to give a clear message that no level of violence against children is allowed. The primary purposes of these laws are first to comply with the UNCRC and other human rights instruments. Second, to support interventions that are more proactive and preventive rather than reactive and punitive after a child has been hurt. And third, to raise awareness of the harms inflicted by corporal punishment and shift social norms and attitudes. Not only is prohibition a legal tool, it's also a powerful educational tool. So laws are very closely connected with the N of INSPIRE, which I'll turn to now. So you might recall N stands for norms and values. The objective of strategies under the N of INSPIRE is to strengthen norms and values that support nonviolent, respectful relationships. This requires a combination of clear laws and public education. This image shows an example of public education conducted in Sweden at the time of the prohibition. This campaign was conducted by putting information on milk cartons for two months to promote discussion among parents and children at mealtimes. The girl in the drawing is saying, never in my life will I hit my children. Now I'd like to show you some data from Sweden that show trends since the ban. Because Sweden passed its ban, ban so long ago, there's now a lot of data available to assess whether norms and values have indeed shifted. So let's look first at the proportion of adults in Sweden who believe that corporal punishment is necessary. In 1965, about half the adult population believed that corporal punishment is necessary in raising children. By 1981, that proportion had decreased by half, and by 2009, it had reached zero. By 2011, 92% of adults believed that it's wrong to hit or slap a child, 
even if the child had made the parent very angry. In terms of behavior, the proportion of parents who hit their children has been reduced virtually to zero. I'll also show you a bit of data from Germany where uh, corporal punishment was prohibited in 2000. And there, national surveys were carried out before and after the, the prohibition. You can see here that the proportion of parents who believe that slaps make children see reason decreased, and the proportion who believe that smacking teaches children to accept violence increased. It's important to point out that it's not only the actual passage of the law that contributes to attitude change. The public discussion that precedes it has a very important awareness raising and educational function because previously normalized behavior becomes reframed as harmless and unacceptable. And we can see that in the lives of children. This next graph compares the experiences of youth who were growing up before those discussions took place to the experiences of youth who were growing up during the height of those discussions. Those who were youth in 1992 were far more likely to have experienced various forms of corporal punishment than those who were youth just 10 years later, around the time of the band's passage. The third country I'll present data from is New Zealand, which is a third example of normative shifts related to law reform. New Zealand prohibited all corporal punishment in 2007. Here you can see that the percent of adults who believe that there are circumstances when it's all right for a parent to physically punish a child decreased by more than half between 1993 and 2013. And finally, uh, we'll look at whether parental behavior changed along with beliefs in New Zealand. This graph shows that the proportion of parents who physically punished their children in the previous four weeks declined by almost half over the 10 years following the ban's passage. Now, at some point, some of you might be wondering whether it's the law or the public education campaigns accompanying law reform that make the bigger difference. Well, interestingly, a team of German researchers conducted a five country study to try to tease out these effects. At the time of the study, Sweden, Germany, and Austria had prohibited all corporal punishment. Spain and France had not yet done so. Sweden and Germany had conducted public education campaigns along with their law reforms, but Austria had not. Spain had been doing public education since 1998 in an effort to raise awareness and shift norms, but had not yet prohibited corporal punishment. And France had done neither. So these five countries represented um, four conditions. A combination of prohibition and public education, that's Sweden and Germany. Prohibition only, that's Austria. Public education only, that's Spain and neither prohibition nor public education, and that was France. Busman and his team conducted standardized face-to-face -face interviews of a thousand parents in each country. And here's just one representative sample of what they found, and this pattern was found again and again. So this will show the percentage of parents who reported using physical punishment. Parents living in the countries with both prohibition and public education were very unlikely to use corporal punishment. Parents living in a country with prohibition, but no public education, were somewhat more likely to use corporal punishment. But parents living in a country with public education, but no prohibition, were much more likely to use corporal punishment. And those living in a country with neither prohibition nor public education were very likely to use corporal punishment. We know that behavior is driven by attitudes and attitudes reflect social norms. In order to change both, 
we must target both. To shift attitudes, we must delegitimate corporal punishment in the public mind, redefine it as violence, and set a clear standard that no child may be hurt in the name of discipline. We also need to provide information and support to explain why this change is taking place and to help parents reach the goal of nonviolent parenting. If public messaging and legal standards contradict each other, the impact of each one will be greatly reduced. I'm going to end by showing you a current example of law reform and public education in action. This is a 60 second ad. Um, I'm just going to have to uh, come out of my screen sharing for a moment to click something here. Okay, here we go. Um, this is a 60 second ad to raise awareness of the Welsh prohibition, which will come into effect in March, 2022. It's called the sound of change. This is the sound of change. From the 21st of March 2022, the law in Wales will change to protect us and our rights. No one will be allowed to use any kind of physical punishment like smacking to discipline us. To find out more, visit gov.wales slash nphysicalpunishment. I hope that that leaves everyone with a somewhat of a vision of what this could look like and how we can provide both legal standards and information and support to change the lives of children. Thank you very much, Joan, for again, a super clear presentation that demonstrates that prevention is entirely possible by showing us the evidence from several countries. So I think my understanding at this point is we are unable to hold the planned poll because the Zoom function is playing up. So we'll go straight into the panel discussion. Could I ask all the speakers today to put on your videos? And Stephanie Burrows, my colleague from WHO, who's helped organize this session, has been following the chat function and will read out batches of questions and possibly suggest who should be answer answering them. Over to you, Stephanie. Uh, and sorry, we'll continue with the questions until 20 minutes past the hour, if we have that many questions. Over to you, Stephanie. Hi, thanks, Alex, and every hello, everybody. Um, indeed, we have quite a lot of questions, so I will just ask a couple of them. Um, so there was one question, particularly about, do we have a, a prevalence level for corporal punishment in schools in particular? Uh, because I think we had more uh, prevalence levels for those in the in the home. And a couple of people made some comments about disability, and then there was a specific question around how can we create, a, create an environment where children with disabilities are protected from corporal punishment. And then just a final one, which is specifically for you, Jorge, um, which uh, said that the your presentation really made it clear of the effects on the on the brain. Um, but does that mean that you propose a dose response relationship? And if so, does the response, does the, that relationship, um, is it related to the frequency or the severity of the punishment? So perhaps if um, anybody feel free to answer the first two and then we could go to Jorge for the third one. And then I'll read some more um, questions later. Well, I can begin with the question about uh, corporal punishment in schools um, it, it, and the prevalence of that. It really depends on the country. Um, some countries, sadly, it seems upwards of 85, 90% of children experience corporal punishment in schools. Um, and so I did a survey, I did an article a few years ago that's in my list of references, and I have a table summarizing the prevalence by country. Um, and so some countries, it's 90%, uh, sadly. An art, uh, there was an article from Uganda that found 90% of students had been subject to corporal punishment in schools. And that can mean 
hitting with an object. It also could mean hitting on the head or hitting on the ear as a teacher walks by. Um, it takes all forms, sadly. Um, so there's a wide range, um, I guess, uh, but I think it's much more prevalent than most people are aware. Joan, do you want to take the second question? I'm trying to remember what the second question was. Uh, yes, Stephanie, can you remind us what the second question was, please? It was uh, talking about disability. So because uh, disabled children are often more at risk of corporal punishment. And how is there uh, something particular that we can do to protect those children? Well, in my opinion, a, a lot has to do with how much supports are in place for, for families um, in general and specifically for families of children with disabilities. Um, in many places, parents of children with disabilities have very little support and are left to figure out how to care for the child and and teach the child and work and provide um, for children who perhaps can't be left by themselves or um, are not able to attend schools in many places. So the stress levels on those families are very high. Now in some countries, particularly um, Scandinavian countries, a lot of resources are put into ensuring that children with disabilities have the same accessibility rights as every other child. So their disability is viewed as being within the environment, not within the child. So if a child is unable to access um, play groups or childcare or school, the problem is within those institutions, not within the child. And so those institutions are changed and families are provided with economic and um, other kinds of supports. So, you know, clearly the whole world can't, isn't um, able to do that, but it's also a matter of priorities and, and where economic supports are targeted. Um, I think reducing stress is a huge piece of this. It's, it's awareness, but it's also addressing the root causes of why people hit other people. And it's stress and frustration and an inability to control what they feel the need to control. So the more control we can give to families over their daily lives, the less likely they'll feel the need to hit. Okay, perfect. So I think I can now jump to the third question. So I, I guess that to answer this question on whether the consequences of corporal punishment will scale in relation to the severity or the frequency of corporal punishment, I would take a step back to first think about what the science of child development tells us about exposure to any form of violence. In particular, the science tells us that uh, even though different children are exposed to the same adversity, for example, let's say, physical maltreatment, different children could experience different outcomes later in life, informing us and telling us that uh, these exposures are not deterministic, but can act as risk factors. But at the same time, we have something that's called resilience, right, which is positive adaptation in the face of adversity. Having said that, we can think about this just as we think about smoking. We know that uh, a lot of people have smoked uh, throughout their lives without having any lung disease or any issue with their health. But maybe for other people who smoke uh, less, only for a couple of months or a couple of years, they can develop certain uh, affectations. We can think just like that for corporal punishment and for exposure to different forms of violence. What we are saying is not that every single child who is exposed to an adversity is gonna have negative outcomes throughout his or her lifespan. What we are saying is that this constitutes a major risk factors uh, that if it's uh, also present with other adversities and lack of support from parents uh, can constitute a major uh, barrier for their, for their healthy uh, development. So what we can hypothesize from the beginning is that as it is more frequent or severe, it can lead to worse consequences, just as we can hypothesize that smoking more frequently can also lead to uh, more, more harm as well. Okay, thanks very much. 
Um, there was also some um, lack of clarity, I think, around the definition, because I know it was presented earlier, but perhaps you could just go over the definition of corporal punishment. And then um, would you say that the people that you work with in the field, do they have a good understanding of it too? Or is there some kind of commun uh, communication issue in, in promoting this? Uh, there was another question about that too. Um, so that was something about the, the, um, the definitions. Um, and then somebody else also asked that um, some of the research seems to specifically differentiate the harsh and the moderate and harsh versions of corporal punishment, which seems to imply that light punishment is, is not a problem. So if you could just feed back um, a little bit more on that. And I'll pause there and then I think I'll come back to some of the other questions. I can take the definitional question um, and I can just repeat the definition that I provided from the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, which is fairly vague and so I'll, I'll clarify a little bit, but their definition is that corporal punishment is uh, the use of physical force intended to cause some degree of pain or discomfort, however light. And so any form of hitting or any kind of striking or causing pain to a child is considered corporal punishment. Now, how the form that takes differs across the country, across all countries. Um, sometimes it involves just hitting a child with a hand, sometimes some kind of object, and any kind of object. Parents are quite creative in thinking about which objects to use to hit children. Um, but then there are also things such as uh, kneeling on hard surfaces, uh, such as rice, um, making a child stand in a, one position for a long time, causing them to feel pain making children over exert themselves um, in harsh circumstances, um, putting um, harsh things or spicy things in their mouth or making them eat noxious substances. All of these things are causing pain and discomfort to the child. They are all considered corporal punishment. Um, I think when we, the traditional way is thinking of hitting a child with a hand or an object, but they're, all of these things cause pain and discomfort to the child. And so they're all considered corporal punishment. It really depends on, on the country. I think the question is getting at how can we make a definition that can cut across countries so that people working with families will have a good definition. And I think if we just think about the child's experience, if it makes the child experience pain, then that's corporal punishment. It doesn't matter what form it takes. We wanna avoid hurting children and, and we want to emphasize that hurting children is not a way to teach them how to behave. Um, it teaches them fear and anger and um, being afraid of their parents. It does not teach them how to behave. And so those are kind of the messages that we want to try to get across that regardless of what form it takes, it's all harmful to children. Do one of you want to take the question about mild versus severe? Or I, I'm happy to take that one too, but it's up to you all. Joan, do you want to take that one? Or? Yeah, I'd love to. Thanks, Liz. Um, yes, this is a, a really interesting issue. And I think that the this continuing of distinguishing between mild and severe corporal punishment is a really a reflection of these embedded norms that so many of us carry. So in research and in law, these people are always trying to make these distinctions. But what's being missed there is the experience of the child. So whether I'm hit once, three times, five times, 10 times, I'm being hit by someone I love and trust and who's supposed to protect and care for me. So this, this attempt to distinguish between mild and severe on the basis of force or frequency or, you know, because I think being hit with an object is worse than being hit with a hand. Whereas, you know, for a child, it might not make any difference at all. So these hierarchies of severity are created by adults and not by children. And I think if we looked at the experiences of children, they wouldn't make a lot of sense to them. So even when we think about frequency, a child who is hit often, we know is at risk of all of these outcomes, but a child who's hit once within the context of an otherwise trusting relationship could be really traumatized by that experience because that trust has broken down. 
so, you know, even using frequency as a measure of some kind of harshness or severity, it, it doesn't necessarily make sense from the point of view of the child's experience. And there's very little research on children's perspectives on corporal punishment, but what research there is suggests that it is profoundly distressing and creates rifts in relationships, generates hatred, hostility, desire for revenge, a desire to withdraw from the family, to run away. Uh, it, all, and this is around what is called smacking. So we often call smacking mild, but from the child's point of view, it can be a profoundly distressing experience. And so I would personally like to see the end of these terms like spanking and smacking because they trivialize and um, they trivialize violence. We don't have terms like that for any form of violence against other people. And they even sound funny. If you say the word spank, people laugh. It's it kind of, you know, they make jokes about it. And it's, it's an act of hurting a child willfully. So we need to really change our language and we need to think about what it means to be hurt by someone you love and trust as a little child with no way to make a change. Okay, thanks. Uh, if, if I may. Uh, would you sorry. like to add something? Yeah, if I may, I just would, would like to add something to, to that excellent response by Young. And is that, yeah, it is, it is indeed the case that differentiating between mild or normative corporal punishment and harsher corporal punishment has often implied uh, or has made some people to think that light corporate punishment or spanking or smacking uh, is not a problem, right? And that's exactly why in some of these studies we have tried uh, to really focus on those socially normative forms of corporal punishment, such as spanking, to demonstrate that even those forms that are socially normative, are legal, are accepted by societies, also lead to these exact same negative consequences, not only on behavior and cognitive development, but also to actual changes on how the brain functions, further demonstrating that both are parts of a continuum of violence uh, and are violence leading to the exact same negative uh, consequences. Great, thanks very much. Oh, uh, Joan, you'd like to just add something? Yeah, can I just make one more point? Uh, one of my fellow Canadians has raised a point in the chat about Canada's law, and this is representative of many situations around the world. In Canada, we still have a legal defense for, for parents who use corporal punishment. The Supreme Court decided that such punishment was reasonable, legal, fine, acceptable, as long as the child is between two and 12, the, a hand isn't used, and the child's hit below the chin. There is no empirical evidence that if you hit a child below the chin, it's not gonna harm them, and you hit them on the head that will. There's no reason to expect the child who's turning two tomorrow is at any less risk than they are today. These are arbitrary, kind of ridiculous, very adult-centered laws that exist to protect adults. Our law is in the the part of the criminal code called protection of persons in authority. It's about protecting adults. It's not about protecting children. And so governments around the world are wrestling with this. What's okay and what isn't? And in some places, it's, it's okay to do anything to a child as long as you don't kill them or cause organ damage. You know, these lines are absurd and have nothing to do with human rights or research. Okay, there's a lot of uh, questions, very many, so let's, if we can move on. Um, the, lots of people are asking, okay, well, if um, we don't use corporal punishment, then what are some of the strategies parents can use? I mean, I think you covered it a bit, but maybe you could just go into a little more detail. And then also an issue around enforcement. So if a country has a law, how does it actually get enforced or how do you ensure that it gets enforced? And for this one, perhaps um, Sonia, who's going to be speaking later, could also come in here if necessary. Um, and then related to that, um, for maybe the big agencies, uh, how would you advise uh, people to engage with member states? Um, for those who have actually ratified the UN Conventions on the Right of the Child, 
and they um but at the same time they are they are not dealing with corporal punishment and so there's a mismatch there and how do um well maybe the big agencies but also people on the ground how what's the best way of dealing with that Joan, do you want to take the what to do instead? <laughs> okay, I'd be happy to. Um, I have had the very good fortune of working with Save the Children Sweden over the last decade or so on um, a program called Positive Discipline and Everyday Parenting. It's not for profit. And uh, we've been implementing it in 30 or 40 countries. And it's, it's a completely non-punitive approach. When, when I was working on this, I realized that it, you, you, can't, you can't change a mindset that believes that hurting a children is effective uh, by simply replacing that with emotional pain. So you can, if you're going to really try to shift the way adults think about children as full human beings who are learning, then we have to move away from punishment, the timeouts, the taking things away, all those disempowering things that we do to children that tell them, you are powerless around me and I can make you do whatever I want. So what we try to do is help parents understand how children see the world, how their brains develop, how their emotions develop and start to, to learn how to scaffold their learning as opposed to policing and coercing, supporting, informing, guiding. And uh, we found that it, it really is, has, has had a tremendously positive response in all regions of the world. It, it seems to just um, give parents the, the okay to really love their children and to be kind to them, which is um, really kind of a, a new, a new way of thinking in, in many places that, you know, this idea that kindness spoils children. Um, we know that's just simply not the case. It isn't the case for any of us. Kindness strengthens relationships and enhances learning. And so we talk about warmth and structure, making sure the environment is safe physically and emotionally. And structure is providing the information and support and scaffolding that children need in order to learn and, and to grow. So that's it in a very tiny nutshell. But um, if anyone is interested in this approach, we you can go to the website Positive Discipline in Everyday Life. Sonia, do you want to take the question of enforcement and engaging with and member states? Uh, well, we've. Uh define some uh, key steps for implementing the law uh, prohibiting corporal punishment, but I'm happy to talk about it in my presentation because I was planning to go through those steps, but definitely the idea is to, to have a, a communication system, like we saw the, the, the Welsh example, and also having it in a, a national action plan and so on, and then evaluating the plan. So I, I can talk about it later. And uh, as for um, member states not, um, prohibiting corporal punishment, not taking action to prohibit or eliminate, then uh, we, we can talk about uh, the pressure put on, on these states by uh, treaty bodies, like the Committee on the Right of the Child, the Committee Against Torture, and the role of NGOs as well, other stakeholders, to put pressure to advocate to, for the state to um, prohibit corporal punishment. We're now talking about, we at End Violence, we have a system of pathfinding countries as well, where countries commit to have a national action plan to end violence against children. So we try to push them, to accompany them, to support them, to uh, prohibit corporal punishment, to include the prohibition as well. And it's not only obviously about prohibiting, it's about implementing the, the law as well. So it's continuous pressure. Sometimes we have, the law, but they are not uh, implemented at, at all. And sometimes state clearly say that they are in support of corporal punishment. So it's about uh, lobbying states and showing example. Research is important to show them how harmful it can be. So yeah, I hope I've answered. And I think we've got so many questions and I'm so sorry that we won't be able to cover them all. So I'll just ask uh, the last set. Um, 
And maybe Sonia, this is also for your, you, and I'm not sure that you would be answering it in your presentation. Um, so maybe I could ask that now. It's about customary laws. So, um, how can you work around a situation in a country where that says something different? Um, and then finally, the other question is, is there a link between corporal punishment and society um, wider, by, well, society in the wider, I mean, sorry, is there a relationship between corporal punishment and violence in the wider society? So perhaps maybe Sonia, if you could answer the more specific question about the customary law and then um, any of the others can answer the second part. Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah, in terms of customary it's a law, it's a tricky situation. It's not only customary law. Sometimes you also have religious laws. And it's difficult because it's about the hierarchy we have between the laws and the countries uh, where it is. If, for example, you have prohibition of corporal punishment included in the constitution, this is the ideal situation because then the constitution is above all laws, religious customary, so it applies corporal punishment is prohibited. But if it's only, I mean, only the laws, common laws, for example, it becomes more uh, complicated. Often it goes to the Supreme Court, it goes to the Constitutional Court and the court will make the decision. And in fact, state parties go, they sign international or regional uh, instrument, and these are above customary laws. The moment the state has ratified an instrument saying that it, it, it is committed to uh, um, prohibit any form of violence against children, that should apply whatever customary law and Sharia law is. But it's difficult in practice where you have countries in uh, Nigeria, for example, with Sharia law or Saudi Arabia, where it is difficult, even though the judge will say it is uh, prohibited, corporal punishment should not be uh, implemented, used, you still have uh, customary law. So, the campaign is also to change the law, Sharia law, if possible at all. So that's uh, to be my answer. Stephanie, I know there was one more question to be answered about the relationship between corporal punishment and prevailing levels of other types of violence in society. But mindful of the time, if we could have a two minute answer for that, we will then move to Sonia's presentation. So who's willing to take on that question in two minutes? There is a link. <laughs> There's a link. Yeah, I'll just say quickly that acceptance of violence in general will, will increase acceptance of violence in any kind of relationship as a way of solving problems. Um, and so definitely there, there is, but that doesn't mean that we still can't make inroads in, in changing the use of corporal punishment. And also Thank a link you. with um, punishment, belief in punishment in general as a way of changing adults' behavior as well. It tends to be Great. more thanks to, thanks to everyone who asked the good questions, and I'm sorry we couldn't answer more of them. Thanks to Stephanie for collecting them and conveying them to the panelists, and thanks to the panelists for the great answers. Now, over to Sonia, who will be followed by Howard, and I must at this point excuse myself because during Sonia's talk, I have to move to another meeting. Sonia, over to you. Thank you. I will be... Um, sorry, I'm sharing my screen. Okay, sorry. I will, uh, my presentation actually will highlight uh, the human rights dimension of uh, ending, prohibiting corporal punishment of children uh, in all settings. Uh, we have to prohibit corporal punishment because uh, it's the most common form of violence against children. And also because it's recommended by uh, international and regional human rights instrument that most countries have uh, ratified uh, regularly, systematically, actually, the Committee on the Right of the Child, uh, the Committee Against uh, Torture, and at regional level, for example, the Committee, the African Committee on the Right and Welfare of the Child, recommend, ask state parties to take all measures to um, eliminate corporal punishment. So there is pressure on the state parties to uh, prohibit and end corporal punishment of children. Prohibiting corporal punishment is also, we, we mentioned it earlier, it's a way of uh, reaching a sustainable development goals. We talked about 
um, the SDG uh, target 16.2, but it also relates to other SDGs, for example, in public health, education, gender, and uh, law reform to better protect uh, children against torture. Prohibiting corporal punishment as well is uh, a way of uh, raising children's status in society because there's no reason why children should not be protected like uh, adults against violence and, and regardless of uh, the circumstances. So that's the human right dimension of uh, prohibiting ending corporal punishment of children. We talked about the progress in uh, ending corporal punishment. We can see 60 states have uh, prohibited uh, corporal punishment as uh, October 2021. So clearly a uh, progress compared to uh, 1979 when uh, Sweden first uh, prohibited corporal punishment. Uh, we're hoping to have more uh, states prohibiting even this year. So it's uh, we can see a clear momentum and then we are quite confident that now public opinion and states and government are committed to uh, prohibit corporal punishment. We have reason to be confident, but also it is not enough. There's more work to be done because we talked about 60 states prohibiting, 63 states prohibiting corporal punishment, but that represents only 14% of the child population worldwide. So really more has to be done. In fact, in some countries, 10% of children living in some country are not pro uh, protected against, uh, against uh, corporal punishment uh, legally at all in any setting, meaning that wherever they are, they can be subjected to corporal punishment by any adult. You find that you see these countries in the map in purple, so you can see them, for example, in Saudi Arabia, and Malaysia and Botswana, but there are other countries as well. So really more has to be done. In my next slide, as the question was raised, we were asking about elimination, meaning uh, implementing the laws prohibiting corporal punishment. So it is good to have a law. We enact the law. In fact, I'm talking of, we're talking about law, but it, it can always be in the constitution. It can, it can also be um, a decision from a high court, like the Constitutional Court in South Africa made a decision to declare in corporal punishment and constitutional. So if we have this instrument, if we have the law, if we have the constitution or the judgment, this has to be included in the national action plan to end violence against children, or even a national action plan to end corporal punishment of children in the country it's better to have it in a plan that is costed and then that is uh, adapted to the national, local and community level to be implemented. And it's also important to communicate, to raise awareness about the prohibition of corporal punishment in the country. We saw that excellent uh, um, clip from uh, the Wales, uh, Wales experience, but we have it also in other countries like in Sweden, in Honduras, where there's an active, an active campaign to raise awareness about uh, the end of prohibition of corporal punishment. And also we have to have support mechanism in place. We have to protect, we have to uh, support parents when that is prohibition, when it is prohibition in, in the home. But we also have to provide training to teachers as well because there are other settings where corporal punishment should be prohibited. And uh, we often say that it's not the lack of training should not be an excuse for continuing to use corporal punishment. It is recommended to have the support, but if there is a law in place, it has to be uh, implemented. And also we talk about monitoring. We have to evaluate the plan and see where we are at. If uh, there's any challenges, we see how we can address them so that we ensure that children are actually effectively protected against corporal punishment in all settings. So these are the key steps that we've uh, tried to identify to uh, eliminate corporal punishment of children in all settings. So I want to, before I conclude, I want you to show, uh, to talk about some uh, new resource uh, material that we developed as we talked about. Uh, we've been talking about uh, the harmful effect of corporal punishment 
on children's health, we have uh, developed a new paper, in fact, a series of papers. We have a full working paper. It's a compilation of uh, research finding on the harmful effect of corporal punishment. We have a summary briefing, it's about seven pages, and uh, oh, just a one-page research uh, headlines about the harmful effect of uh, corporal punishment on, on children. This can be used as an advocacy tool. It can be used uh, by um, anyone, campaigner, activist, academia, or not. And then also we have a, a paper on the, the impact of prohibition. Joan talked about it the moment where we have prohibition in place and the change of attitude, uh, public opinion in support, increasingly in support of uh, prohibition of corporal punishment. So we have all these documents and a clear example country by countries. You may find this research on uh, our website, uh, the End Corporal Punishment website. And uh, you can find also further uh, resource on the, our End Violence website as well, and then you can see it on my screen. So this is how I'm going to end my presentation. And I think uh, Howard will want to say more. So I will have to stop share so that uh, Howard can take over. Howard, over to you. Thank you, Sonia. And uh, let me begin just by thanking uh, a few critical people for today's event. Etienne, Alex and Stephanie and colleagues at the World Health Organization for your support with today's event. To the great presentations and the discussions uh, from Liz, from Jorge, from Joan, and of course, all the research and your championing and advocacy of this issue that lies behind that. We are, as a community, extremely grateful. And it's been a real privilege to hear again from you this morning. And then to my colleague, Sonia, who just spoke, but also to Bess, uh, who with Sonia co-leads our End Violence Partnership work stream on ending cultural punishment. And finally, and perhaps most importantly to all of you who have joined today, because I've been watching the chat and it's incredible. We've had people, I think, from pretty much every continent, people all over the world. Some of you I know must be up very late at night. For others, it's probably very early in the morning. Um, thank you for joining. I hope that you leave today's event informed and inspired. And I personally have been really struck again that corporal punishment is prevalent everywhere. We heard that articulated so powerfully by Liz at the start of today's event. And in fact, it is the most prevalent form of violence and abuse of children. It has an individual, a societal and an economic impact, but critically it's preventable. And we've heard from Joan and from others, whether it's a prohibition approach, public education, or perhaps most powerfully as Joan shared research, the combination of prohibition and public education. And today's presentations, my understanding is that they are based on more than 300 studies carried out over 50 years and involving hundreds of thousands of children. And together, this evidence base, I feel, is a really compelling case, both for the action and the investment that's necessary to tackle corporal punishment all over the world. And the good news, as we've heard today, is that there are evidence-based solutions. The INSPIRE strategies, uh, which of course include both the enactment of laws so that children have the same protection uh, from violence that most adults take for granted, and critically, as has been mentioned today, the implementation of those laws with a multi sectoral plan, public education and support for parents and carers. And in the countries that take those steps, again, as we've heard today, we are seeing a significant decrease in corporal punishment and violence against children, as well, of course, as the wider benefits across the whole of society. And from 40 years ago, where only one country, Sweden, had prohibited corporal punishment today. As Sonia just reminded us, there are 63 states which had issue, issued bans. But we look at the 63 and we look at the 130 or so who haven't, and we have to conclude we must go further and we can go further and we must go faster. We must see, I think, much more progress. I wouldn't even say the next 40 years, I'd say hopefully the next 10 years or less um, than we've seen in the last 40. And I think in doing so, we will be challenging the fact that much of the world corporal punishment of children is still legally and socially accepted, but at the same time, sharing the evidence of what works as we've heard today, what works, why it works, why it makes sense, both from a public health perspective, but also from an economic perspective. That's so often the case that sometimes leaders and decision makers need to hear. They may be persuaded of the right case, but they're looking also at the economic case. Uh, as well as the legal reasons. And do this in a compelling and persuasive way. And if we do that, I think we can galvanize both the political commitment and leadership, we can kickstart the legal response that's necessary and prompt the conversation 
in society and do that coupled with support, which includes public education, support for parents, support for teachers and others to use non-violent discipline. So today we are, I think, calling on countries to commit to and to start the legislative process to prohibit corporal punishment in all settings by 2030, to accelerate the implementation of prohibition and to include in that making positive parental support available to all, promoting safe schools and communities to support children so that they can report and respond to and recover from violence, abuse and physical discipline where they have experienced it. And to measure progress, to measure progress so we can monitor the incorporation of SDG 16.2.1, which was mentioned earlier, and the proportion of children who are experiencing corporal punishment, incorporate that into regular national statistical programs. So we know what's happening. We can monitor, we can measure, and we can adjust accordingly. And um, just to conclude with our partners who are many on this call and beyond, the M Violence Partnership, we will continue to make the case for action. We will support countries on their journey to tackle corporal punishment as part of the wider efforts to make sure that every child, wherever they may live, grows up safe, secure, and in a nurturing environment. Thank you so much again to everybody for joining us today. Sonia has shared a whole host of resources to go for more information. I hope you leave this as I do, uh, inspired, informed, and galvanized to step up more, to do our part to take more action to end corporal punishment everywhere. Thank you. Guess I'll sign out. Bye, everyone. Thank you for this fantastic opportunity, and um, hope we will be in touch soon. And I will get back to you, Beth. <laughs> Have a good day and evening, everyone. Bye, John.